Narrative of My Captivity Among the Sioux Indians by Fanny Kelly. Chapter 26 Elizabeth Blackwell. Mormon Home. A Brutal Father. The Mother and Daughters Flee to the Mountains. Death of the Mother and Sisters from Exposure. Elizabeth Saved by an Indian. A White Woman Tortured. Rescued Children. The Box Family. Capture of Mrs. Blynn. Some few weeks after the events just related, I received a note from a stranger, requesting me to call on her at the dwelling of a hunter, where she was stopping. Her name was Elizabeth Blackwell, and emigrated with her parents from England, who became proselytes of the ruling prophet of Salt Lake City, where they remained until Elizabeth's father took another wife. This created trouble. Words ensued, soon followed by blows, and Elizabeth, in endeavoring to protect her mother, was struck by her brood of a father with a knife, and one of her eyes destroyed. Being discouraged and broken-hearted, the wretched mother and daughters, for Elizabeth had two sisters, resolved to escape. They wandered away among the mountains, and, having no place of shelter, all perished with the cold except Elizabeth, who was found by the Indians nearly frozen to death. They lifted her up and carried her to camp, where they gave her every attention requisite for restoration. She remained with the Indians until she was able to go east, where she underwent the severe operation of having both legs amputated above the knee. The treatment received from the Indians so attached her to them that she prefers to live a forest life, and when she gave me her narrative, she was on her way from the States to her Indian home. Her father soon wearied of his Mormon wife, and escaped to the Rocky Mountains, where he became a noted highwayman. Hearing of Elizabeth's residence among the Indians, he visited her and gave her a large sum of money. The fate of his family had great effect on him, and remorse drove him to desperation. The husband of Elizabeth took his second wife and Elizabeth's child from Salt Lake to Cincinnati, where they now live. She was twenty-six years old when I saw and conversed with her, a lady of intelligence, and once possessed more than ordinary beauty. She had just received the news of her father's death. He was killed near Fort Dodge, Kansas. Elizabeth related to me many acts of cruelty she had witnessed among the savages, one of which was to the following effect. A woman was brought into the camp on horseback, who had been captured from a train, and an Indian who was attempting to lift her from the horse was shot in the act by her own hand. This so enraged the savages that they cut her body in gashes, filled them with powder, and then set fire to it. The sight of the woman's sufferings was too much for Elizabeth to endure, and she begged the savages to put an end to the victim at once, which accordingly was done. But although Elizabeth saw many heartless acts, many terrible scenes, still she had a kindly feeling toward the Indians, for they saved her from a horrible death by starvation and exposure, and had been very tender with her. She was somewhat embittered toward the white people on account of her sufferings and treatment. A short time after, General Sully invited me to Fort Harker to see two white captive children, a girl of fourteen and a boy of six. They had been captured two years before, and the account of their treatment given me by the girl was anything but favorable. The boy was as wild as a deer. A Sioux woman at Fort Harker had taken these children into her own family and cared for them as a mother. She was the daughter of a white man, was born at Fort Laramie, and had married an interpreter by the name of Bradley. She was quite intelligent, having been educated by her husband. In January 1868, two other children were captured in the state of Texas by the Kiowa Indians. They were girls aged five and three years. Their parents and all the known relatives had been murdered, and the children had been recently recovered from the Indians, and were in the care of J. H. Leavenworth, United States Indian agent. Having no knowledge of their parentage, they were named Helen and Heloise Lincoln. Another interesting family was taken from Texas by the Indians, their beautiful home destroyed, 
and all killed with the exception of the mother and three daughters. Their name was Box. The ages of the children were respectively eighteen, fourteen, and ten, and they were allowed to be together for a time, but afterward were separated. They experienced great cruelties. The youngest was compelled to stand on a bed of live coals in order to torture the mother and sisters. Lieutenant Hesselberger, the noble and brave officer whose name will live forever in the hearts of the captives he rescued, heard of this family, and, with a party of his brave men, went immediately to the Indian village, and offered a reward for the captives, which at first was declined, but he at length succeeded in purchasing the mother and one girl. He afterward procured the release of the others. Lieutenant Hesselberger braved death in so doing, and his only reward is the undying gratitude of those who owe their lives to his self-sacrificing, humane devotion and courage. In the fall of 1868, the Indians commenced depredations on the frontier of Kansas, and after many serious outbreaks, destroying homes and murdering settlers, the governor issued a call for volunteers to assist General Sheridan in protecting the settlers and punishing the Indians. Among those who volunteered was my youngest brother, and many of my old schoolmates and friends from Geneva, who related to me the following incidents, which are fully substantiated by General Sheridan and others. Mrs. Morgan, an accomplished and beautiful bride, and Miss White, an educated young lady, were both taken from their homes by the Indians. They were living on the Republican River. During their captivity they suffered much from the inclemency of the weather, and it was March before they were released by General Sheridan. The troops, the Kansas boys, were all winter among the mountains, endeavoring to protect the frontier. They suffered great privation, being obliged sometimes to live on the meat of mules, and often needing food. All honor to these self-sacrificing men, who braved the cold and hunger of the mountains to protect the settlers on the frontier. A Mrs. Blynn, whose maiden name was Harrington, of Franklin County, Kansas, who was married at the age of nineteen and started with her young husband for the Pacific coast, was taken prisoner by the Indians and suffered terrible brutality. About that time the savages had become troublesome on the plains, attacking every wagon train, killing men and capturing women. But the train in which Mr. Blynn and his wife traveled was supposed to be very strong and able to repel any attack made upon them, should there be any such trouble. Mrs. Blynn had a presentiment of evil, of the fate of their unfortunate company and her own dark impending destiny, in a dream, the realization of which proved too true. When she related her dream to her husband, he tried to laugh away her superstitious fears, and prevent its impression on her mind. It was not many days after that a large number of warriors of the Sioux tribe were seen in the distance, and the people of the train arranged themselves in a shape for attack. The Indians, seeing this preparation, and fearing a powerful resistance, fired a few shots, and, with yells of rage and disappointment, went off. Within the succeeding days the travelers saw Indians, but they did not come near enough to make trouble. Confident of no disturbance or hindrance to their journey, the happy emigrants journeyed on fearless, comparatively, of the redskins, and boasting of their power. But the evil hour at last approached. When the column had reached Sand Creek, and was in the act of crossing, Suddenly the wild yells of Indians fell upon their ears, and soon a band of Cheyennes charged down upon them. Two wagons had already got into the stream, and instead of hastening the others across, and thus putting the creek between themselves and their pursuers, the whites drove the two back out of the water, and, entangled in the others, threw everything in confusion. This confusion is just what the Indians like, and they began whooping, shouting, and firing furiously, in order to cause a stampede of the livestock. In five minutes all was accomplished. All the animals, except those well fastened to the wagons, were dashing over the prairie. The Indians then circled around and fired a volley of bullets and arrows. Mr. Blynn was killed at the second fire, 
while standing before the wagon in which were his wife and child. "'God help them!' was all he said, as, firing his rifle at the Indians for the last time, he sank down dead. The men returned the fire for a while, then fled, leaving their wounded, all their wagons, and the women and children in the hands of the relentless victors. Santana, who led the band, sprang in first, followed by his braves, whom he ordered to let the cowardly pale-faces run away without pursuit. The dead and wounded were scalped, and the women and children taken captive. All were treated with brutal conduct, and, having secured all the plunder they could, the savages set fire to every wagon, and, with the horses they had taken from the train, set out in the direction of their villages. Mrs. Blynn's child, Willie, two years old, cried very much, which so enraged Santana that he seized him by the heels and was ready to dash out his brains, but the poor mother in her agony sprang forward, caught the child, and fought so bravely with the infuriated murderer that he laughed and told her to keep it, for he feared she would fret if he killed it. Mounted on a pony, her child in her arms, she endeavored to please her savage captor by appearing satisfied, dwelling on the hope that some event would occur whereby she might be rescued and restored to her friends. It was for her darling child that she endeavored to keep up her heart and resolve to live. When they arrived at Santana's village, Mrs. Blynn was left alone of all the seven who were taken. Group after group dropped away from the main body, taking with them the women whom they had prisoners. Her hardships soon commenced. For a day or two she was fed sufficiently, but afterward all that she had to eat she got from the squaws in the same lodge with her, and, as they were jealous of her, they often refused to give her anything, either for herself or Willie. An Indian girl, in revenge for an injury done her by Santana, the murderer of her best friend, became a spy for General Sheridan, and endeavored by every means in her power to rescue Mrs. Blynn from the grasp of these savages. But her efforts were unsuccessful. She was a true friend to the unfortunate lady, giving her food and endeavoring to cheer her with the promise of rescue and safe deliverance. The squaws abused her shamefully in the absence of Santana, burning her with sharp sticks and splinters of resinous wood, and inflicting the most excruciating tortures upon her. Her face, breasts, and limbs were one mass of wounds. Her precious little one was taken by the hair of the head, and punished with a stick before her helpless gaze. Mrs. Blynn, the captive, previous to this torture, had written a letter to the general commanding the department, whoever he might be, and sent it by the Indian girl. We insert a copy of this letter, which is sufficient to draw tears from the eye of any one who may read it. Kiowa Village on the Washita River, Saturday, November 7, 1868. Kind friend, whoever you may be, if you will only buy us from the Indians with ponies or anything, and let me come and stay with you until I can get word to my friends, they will pay you well, and I will work for you also, and do all I can for you. If it is not too far to this village, and you are not afraid to come, I pray you will try. The Indians tell me, as far as I can understand, they expect traders to come, to whom they will sell us. Can you find out by the bearer, and let me know if they are white men? If they are Mexicans, I am afraid they will sell us into slavery in Mexico. If you can do nothing for me, write, for God's sake, to W. T. Harrington, Ottawa, Franklin County, Kansas, my father. Tell him we are with the Kiowas, or Cheyennes, and they say when the white men make peace we can go home. Tell him to write to the governor of Kansas about it, and for them to make peace. Send this to him, please. We were taken on October 9th, on the Arkansas below Fort Lyon. My name is Mrs. Clara Blynn. My little boy, Willie Blynn, is two years old. Do all you can for me. Write to the peace commissioners to make peace this fall. For our sake do all you can, and God will bless you for it. If you can let me hear from you, let me know what you think about it. 
Write to my father. Send him this. Goodbye. Mrs. R. F. Blynn. P.S. I am as well as can be expected, but my baby, my darling, darling little Willie, is very weak. Oh, God, help him. Save him, kind friend, even if you cannot save me. Again, goodbye. Mrs. Blynn passed her time in drudgery, hoping against hope up to the morning of the battle, when General Sheridan's gallant soldiers, under the command of General Custer, came charging with loud huzzas upon the village. Black Kettle's camp was the first attacked, though all the village was, of course, aroused. The heart of Mrs. Blynn must have beat wildly, mingling with hope and dread, when she heard the noise and firing and saw the United States soldiers charging upon her captors. Springing forward, she exclaimed, "'Willie, Willie, saved at last!' But the words were scarce on her lips, ere the tomahawk of the revengeful Santana was buried in her brain." and in another instant little Willie was in the grasp of the monster, and his head dashed against a tree. Then, lifeless, he was thrown upon the dying mother's breast, whose arms instinctively closed around the dead baby boy, as though she would protect him to the last moment of her life. General Sheridan and his staff, in searching for the bodies of Major Elliot and his comrades, found these among the white soldiers, and they were tenderly carried to Fort Cobb, where, in a grave outside the stockade, mother and child lie sleeping peacefully, their once bruised spirits having joined the loved husband and father in the land where captivity is unknown. Surely, if heaven is gained by sorrows of earth, this little family will enjoy the brightest scenes of the celestial world. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 Move to Wyoming False Friends. The manuscript of my narrative taken by another party and published. I go to Washington. Mr. Kelly's sudden death, my own sickness, and the scourge of cholera all coming at one time, proved disastrous to me in a pecuniary way. I was defrauded in every way, even to the robbing of my husband's body of the sum of five hundred dollars the day of his death. However, I finally disposed of the remnant of property left, and started for Wyoming, where lived the only persons beside myself who survived the attack on our train. They had prospered, and in a spirit of kindness, as I then thought, invited and prevailed upon me to share their home. It proved a most disastrous move for me. My leisure hours, since my release from captivity, had been devoted to preparing for publication, in book form, a narrative of my experience and adventures among the Indians, and it was completed. The manuscript was surreptitiously taken, and a garbled, imperfect account of my captivity issued as the experience of my false friend, who, by the aid of an Indian, escaped after a durance of only one day and night. I remained in Wyoming one year, then started for Washington, resolved to present a claim to the government for losses sustained at the hands of the Indians. I knew what difficulties beset my path, but duty to my child urged me on, and I was not without some hope of success. After learning of my captivity through Captain Fisk, President Lincoln had issued orders to the different military commanders that my freedom from the Indians must be purchased at any price and my sad story was well known to the then existing authorities when I arrived in Washington. President Grant, learning through a friend from Colorado of my presence, sent for me and assured me of his warmest sympathy. He was cognizant of what had already transpired relative to me, and told me the papers were on file in the War Department in charge of General Sherman. In presenting my claim, many difficulties had to be encountered, but members of Congress, realizing that some compensation was due me, and understanding the delay that would result from a direct application to the Indian Bureau, introduced a bill appropriating to me $5,000 for valuable services rendered the government in saving Captain Fisk's train from destruction, and by timely warning saving Fort Sully from pillage, and its garrison from being massacred. This was done without my having any knowledge of it, until after the bill had passed both houses of Congress and become a law. 
During my stay in Washington, Red Cloud and a delegation of chiefs and head warriors from the different tribes of the Dakota or Sioux Nation arrived. They all recognized me as once having been with their people, and seemed quite rejoiced at the meeting. Some of the good Christian people of the city extended to the Indians, through me, an invitation to attend church one Sabbath, which I made known to Red Cloud, telling him of the great organ, the fine music they would hear, and of the desire the good people had to benefit their souls. Red Cloud replied with dignity that he did not have to go to the big house to talk to the great spirit. He could sit in his teepee or room, and the great spirit would listen. The great spirit was not where the big music was. No, he would not go. None of the Indians accepted the invitation, but some of the squaws went, escorted to the church in elegant carriages. But they soon left in disgust. The dazzling display of fine dresses, the beautiful church, and the big music, none of these had interest for them if unaccompanied by a feast. I attended several of the councils held with the Indians. At one of them, Red Cloud addressed Secretary Cox and Commissioner Parker in a lengthy speech on the subject of his grievances, in which he referred to me as follows. Pointing me out to the Secretary and Commissioner, he said, Look at that woman. She was captured by Silverhorn's party. I wish you to pay her what her captors owe her. I am a man true to what I say, and want to keep my promise. I speak for all my nation. The Indians robbed that lady there, and through your influence I want her to be paid out of the first money due us. Placing his finger first upon the breast of the secretary, and then of the commissioner, as if to add emphasis to what he was about to say, he added, Pay her out of our money. Do not give the money into any but her own hands. Then the right one will get it. In one of my interviews with the chiefs, Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and others desired me to get up a paper setting forth my claims against their people, and they would sign it. I accordingly made out a bill of items and presented it to them, with my affidavit, and a statement setting forth the circumstances of capture and robbery, which was fully explained to them by their interpreter. This document, the chiefs representing the different bands, signed readily. It is inserted elsewhere, with other documents corroborative of the truth of this narrative. It is also signed by another delegation of chiefs I met in New York. With this last interview with the delegation of Indians I met in New York, ends, I trust forever, my experience with Indians. The preparation of the manuscript for this plain, simple narrative of facts in my experience has not been without its pangs. It has seemed, while writing it, as if with the narration of each incident, I was living over again the fearful life I led while a captive. And often I have laid aside the pen to get rid of the feelings which possessed me. But my task is completed and with the ending of this chapter I hope to lay aside for ever all regretful remembrances of my captivity, and, looking only at the silvery lining to be found in every cloud, enjoy the happiness which every one may find in childlike trust in Him who ordereth all things well. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 General Sully's Expedition during the summer of 1864, and while I was a prisoner with the Indians, an expedition composed of Iowa and Minnesota volunteers, with a few independent companies of Nebraska and Dakota men, with one company of friendly Indians of various tribes, started from Fort Sully in Dakota, with a double purpose, under instructions from the War Department of escorting a large emigrant train safely through the Indian country on their way to Idaho, and, if possible, to inflict such punishment on the hostile bands they might meet as would make them willing to sue for peace. The expedition was commanded by General Alfred Sully of the United States Army, a brave, skillful officer and veteran Indian fighter, having spent the best part of twenty-five years' service on the frontier. He was a captain of infantry under General Harney in his memorable campaign of 1857, and was present at the Battle of Ash Hollow, where Harney surprised a large band of Indians, with their families, 
who were slaughtered indiscriminately, inflicting such punishment as made the name of General Harney a terror to the Indians, and at the same time brought upon his head the execration of thin-skinned philanthropists, who thought savages, the noble red men of their imagination, should be conquered only by the sugar-plum and rose-water policy. For many interesting particulars of this expedition, and its bearing upon some of the incidents of my captivity and final ransom, I am indebted to the correspondence of one who was a member of the expedition, written to his family during its progress. The first day's march carries the command to the Cheyenne River, where the topographical engineer, to whom I have referred, was killed. His fate was sad indeed. An officer in the regular army, he served with distinction in the South during the rebellion, participating in over fifty battles, and passing through all without a wound. He was captured by the rebels, paroled, and sent to join General Sully's expedition to make a topographical survey of the country. Having faced danger on many a well-contested field, he held the Indian in utter contempt, and roamed the country along the line of march with reckless indifference to danger. A short time before reaching the place where the command intended to go into camp, Captain Fielner started in advance, accompanied by only one man, a half-breed. Reaching the river, they dismounted, and were about fastening their horses to graze near a grove of wild plum-trees, when two Indians stepped out and one of them shot Captain Fielner, the ball from his rifle passing through both arms and the breast. The advance guard arriving soon after, word was sent back to General Sully, who ordered the company of Dakota Cavalry to deploy and occupy so much of the country as to make it impossible for the Indians to escape. This was done, and, closing toward a center, the two savages were found in a buffalo wallow, a depression in the ground made by the buffaloes, and forming a very good rifle pit. Being addressed in their own language, they refused to surrender, and were shot. General Sully afterward had their heads cut off, and when the command left camp next morning, they graced two pointed stakes on the bank of the river, placed there as a warning to all straggling Indians. The feeling manifested by General Sully on the occasion of Captain Fielner's death was intense. A brave officer, a scientific scholar, and a gentleman of rare social qualities, he had won upon the kindlier feelings of his associates in rank, and was respected by all. His untimely death was sincerely mourned by the whole command. Death by the hand of the enemy had seldom touched that little army, so seldom that when a companion failed to answer at roll call, his absence was felt. The only other officer killed during the three years of General Sully's operations against the Indians was Lieutenant Thomas K. Levitt of Company B, 6th Iowa Cavalry. At the Battle of Whitestone Hill in September 1863, after the Indians had been utterly routed, Lieutenant Levitt went through their deserted camp on foot, his horse having been shot under him, and, approaching a buffalo robe, raised it with the point of his saber, revealing an Indian and squaw who sprang upon him so suddenly that he had no opportunity to defend himself, and, with their knives, stabbed him in several places. Darkness came on, and, separated from his companions, stripped of his clothing and wounded mortally, he was all night exposed to bitter cold. Despite his wounds, he crawled over the ground fully a half-mile, was found next morning, and conveyed to camp, where he died soon after. A young man of superior education, of a wealthy family, he relinquished a lucrative position in a bank and enlisted as a private, but was soon promoted to a lieutenancy, and at the time of his death was acting adjutant general on General Sully's staff. The emigrant train to be escorted by General Sully's command came across from Minnesota, and were met at a point on the Missouri River about four hundred miles above Sioux City. Here the whole party crossed to the west bank of the Missouri, where they went into camp, and remained long enough to recruit their jaded animals, preparatory to a long and fatiguing march into an almost unknown wilderness, jealously guarded by a savage foe. 
During this halt, Fort Rice, now one of the most important fortifications on the Missouri River, was built, and, when the march was resumed, a considerable portion of the command was left to garrison it. Here also General Sully learned that all the tribes of the Sioux Nation had congregated in the vicinity of Knife River, determined to resist his passage through their country, and confident that superior numbers would enable them to annihilate the whole expedition, and gain a rich booty in horses and goods, to say nothing of the hundreds of scalp-locks they hoped to win as trophies of their prowess. About the middle of July the expedition took up its march westward, and after a few days reached Hart River. Meantime, information had been received, from Indians employed as scouts, that the enemy had gathered in strong force at a place called Taka-Akuta, or Deer Woods, about eighty miles to the northwest, and that distance out of the proposed route of the expedition. Accordingly, General Sully ordered the emigrant train and heavy army wagons corralled, rifle pits were dug, and as the emigrants were generally well armed, it was deemed necessary to leave only a small force of cavalry to protect them in case of attack. Putting the balance of the command in light marching order, leaving behind tents and all other articles not absolutely necessary, the little band of determined men started for the camp of the enemy. Although the Indians were aware of the contemplated attack, such was the celerity of General Sully's movements, he came within sight of their camp at least twenty-four hours sooner than they had thought it possible the distance could be accomplished. Taking the Indians by surprise, they not having time, as is their custom, to remove their property and women and children beyond the reach of danger. I was present with this body of Indians when the white soldiers, my countrymen, came in sight. Alternating between hope and fear, my feelings can be better imagined than described. I hoped for deliverance, yet feared disaster and death to that little army. At one o'clock in the afternoon the fight commenced, and raged with great fury until night closed on the scene of conflict, leaving the whites masters of the field and in possession of the Indian camp. Early in the day, I, with the women and children and old men, and such property as could be gathered in our hasty flight, was sent off so as to be out of the way, not to impede the flight of the Indians in case of defeat. This was a terrible blow to the Indians. About eight thousand of them were gathered there, and their village, with all their property, except their horses and dogs, including all the stores of provisions they had gathered for the winter, were lost. Without shelter, without food, driven into a barren, desolate region, devoid of game, death from starvation seemed inevitable. Early next morning pursuit was commenced, but after a march of about five miles was abandoned, as the country beyond was impassable for cavalry. Returning to the scene of the previous day's battle, General Sully spent several hours in destroying the property abandoned by the Indians in their flight. Lodge poles were piled together and fired, and into the flames was cast furs, robes, tents, provisions, and everything that fell into the hands of the soldiers. That night the command camped about six miles from, but within sight of, the battleground, going into camp early in the afternoon. Picket guards were stationed on the hills, three at a post, and soon after the camp was thrown into commotion by the appearance of one of the guard dashing toward camp, at the full speed of his horse, with Indians in pursuit. His companions, worn out with the arduous service of the preceding three days, had laid down to sleep, and before the one remaining on guard could give the alarm, a body of Indians was close upon them. Discharging his rifle to arouse his companions, he had barely time to reach his horse and escape. The bodies of the other two were found next day horribly mutilated, and that night, being within sight of the battleground, the firelight revealed the forms of a large body of savages dancing around the burning ruins of their own homes. Returning to Hart River, General Sully took the emigrants again in charge, and resumed the march toward Idaho. Traversing a country diversified and beautiful as the sun ever shone upon, presenting at every turn pictures of natural beauty such as no artist ever represented on canvas, the expedition at last struck the Mauve Terra, 
or bad lands, a region of the most wildly desolate country conceivable. No pen of writer nor brush of painter can give faintest idea of its awful desolation. As the command halted upon the confines of this desert, the mind naturally reverted to political descriptions of the infernal regions reached in other days. The bad lands of Dakota extend from the confluence of the Yellowstone and Missouri rivers toward the southwest, a distance of about one hundred miles, and are from twenty-five to forty miles in width. The foot of white man had never trod these wilds before. The first day's march into this desert carried the expedition ten miles only, consuming ten hours of time, and leaving the forces four miles from, and within sight of, the camp they left in the morning. On the 7th of August, the advance guard were attacked in the afternoon by a large party of Indians. After a toilsome march of many days, a valley in the wilderness was reached, presenting an opportunity for rest, and here the first vegetation was found for the famished horses. In this valley the troops camped, the advance guard were brought back, having suffered some from the attack of the ambushed savages. Next day commenced one of the most memorable battles ever fought with Indians in the whole experience of the government. The whole Dakota nation, including the supposed friendly tribes, was concentrated there and numbered fully eight thousand warriors. Opposed to them was a mere handful, comparatively, of white men but they were led by one skilled in war, and who knew the foe he had to contend against. For three days the fight raged, and finally, on the night of the third day, and after a toilsome march of ten days through the bad lands, the command reached a broad, open country where the savages made a final, desperate stand to drive the invaders back. They were the wild Dakotians, who had seen but little of the white settlements, and had a contemptuous opinion but a new lesson was to be learned, and it cost them dearly. They had seen guns large and small, but the little mountain howitzers, from which shells were sent among them, they could not comprehend, and asked the Indian scouts accompanying the expedition if all the wagons shot twice. Terrible punishment was inflicted upon the Indians in that three days' fight. At the close of the second day, the brigade wagon-master reported that he had discovered the tracks of a white woman, and believed the Indians held one captive. This was the first intimation General Sully received of my captivity, and, not having received from the western posts any report of captures by Indians, thought it must be some half-breed woman who wore the footgear of civilization." but the sympathetic nature of that brave, noble general was stirred to its depths when his Indian scouts brought in the report that they had talked with the hostile foe, and they had tauntingly said, We have a white woman captive. The Indians were badly whipped, and having accomplished that portion of his mission, General Sully went on with his emigrant train to the Yellowstone River, and beyond that there were long, toilsome marches, but no battles. Early in October the command arrived opposite Fort Rice and went into camp. The tents of the little band of white warriors were hardly pitched before word came that Captain Fisk, with a large party of emigrants and a small escort of soldiers, had been attacked by a large party of Indians, had corralled their train and could not move, but were on the defensive and were confident of holding out until relief should come. They were distant about 180 miles, and the sympathetic nature of the veteran, while it condemned the action of his junior officer, thrilled with an earnest desire to save the women and children of that apparently doomed train. A detail of men from each company of the command was made, and Captain Fisk and his train of emigrants rescued from their perilous situation. Here was received proof positive of the fact that a white woman was held captive by the Indians and while every man would have been willing to risk his life for her rescue, and many applications were made to the general for permission to go out on expedition for that purpose, he had already adopted such measures as must secure her release. Friendly Indians who had accompanied the expedition were sent out to visit the various tribes, to assure them of an earnest desire on the part of the whites for peace, 
and invite them to meet at Fort Sully to make a treaty. The result was that about the latter part of October the vicinity of the fort presented an unusual appearance of animation. Several bands had come in, in anticipation of the big feast that had hitherto preceded all talks. Their disappointment may be imagined when they were told that no talk would be had, nor any feast given, until they brought in the white woman. Their protestations that she was not their captive, and that they could not get her from the band who held her, were of no avail, and at length Tall Soldier, who was thought to be friendly, called for volunteers to go with him for the white woman. About one hundred Indians responded, and the assurance was given that they would get the captive, if even at the expense of a fight with those they went to take her from. Weeks of painful suspense passed, and then came a letter from the captive woman brought by an Indian, in which warning was given of an intent to capture the fort and murder the garrison. The warning was acted upon, and, when on the twelfth day of December a large body of Indians appeared on the bluffs overlooking the fort, that little band of not more than two hundred men was prepared to give them a warm reception should they come with hostile intent. Not only were arms in prime condition, but every heart beat with high resolve. When the cavalcade drew up in front of the fort, and the captive woman, with about twelve of her immediate savage attendants, had passed through the gates, they were ordered closed, shutting out the main body, and leaving them exposed to a raking fire from the guns in the bastions. But no attack was made. The Indians seemed to know that the little band of soldiers were prepared, and went quietly into camp on an island opposite the fort. Next day a council was held, and the terms of the captive's surrender agreed upon. Three unserviceable horses, to replace ponies left with the Ogallalas by the Blackfeet, as a pledge for the captive's return, also fifty dollars worth of presents, some provisions, and a promise of a treaty when General Sully should return. The Indians remained about the fort nearly two weeks, and during that time efforts were made to induce the captive woman to leave the fort and visit them at their lodges, doubtless with the design of recapturing her. After making the captive some presents, they bade adieu. Two months later they returned, apparently very much disappointed, when they found the captive had left for her home. They were soon again upon the war-path. End of chapter 28